You're watching Beyond Markets, where we bring you up to speed on development outcomes in Africa. I'm Kenneth Ibomo. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today. Coming up on Beyond Markets, our focus today is on Eastern and Southern Africa, and we'll find out how the Trade and Development Bank is making moves to build resilience for trade finance in that region. You can join the discussion on social media. Let me know what you think. The hashtag to use is Beyond Markets, and my handle is at Kenneth Ibomo. Now, the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic means Africa has to find new ways and structures to address its development needs to efficiently respond to the pandemic. The World Bank recently approved a $415 million long-term infrastructure facility to the Eastern and Southern African Trade and Development Bank. President and Chief Executive of TDB, Admaster Tades, joins me now to discuss the details of this and unpack how this partnership can help build resilience in Eastern, Afri Eastern and Southern Africa. Thank you so much for your time today, sir. And uh, let me first start by getting your thoughts on COVID-19 and the kind of impact we're seeing it have, some, uh, especially around trade and trade finance in um, Africa. Uh, thank you, Kenneth. Uh, yeah, this has clearly been a very difficult year. 2020 is gonna go down in history as, 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 a, as a year of intense shock, multiple shocks that have worked their way through. Uh, first order, second order, and I think now we're in the third order of the shocks. Uh, so it's been a very difficult year. We know what's been happening on growth. We know what's been happening on employment. And, and of course, trade being a key aspect of the economy has, has been affected. We've seen falling demand for African exports. We've seen disruption of critical imports coming through. We've seen trade balances deteriorate. And we've also seen uh, discontinuities in, in, in logistic systems and value chains. So it's been a very, very rough year, and um, this is going to be the first year in almost uh, two decades where there's been a recession uh, in the African continent and the economies of, of Africa. So it's, it's, it's been one of the worst years we've had since the millennium. Definitely, you put it there, talking about multiple shocks you are talking about. And, but definitely, the FCFTA can um, give, give a glimmer of hope uh, as we look at it. But I'd like you to speak to the, on the AFCFTA and the importance of not losing the progress that we've made, especially around trade and regional integration in the past, uh, say, 10 years. You know, this was supposed to be the year where the AFCFTA was supposed to come into, into full force and we were supposed to see... Uh, the, the signaling effects come through uh, more practically, slowly, but, but, but surely more uh, than we've seen in the past in terms of facilitation. Uh, but clearly there's quite a few institutional matters that remain outstanding uh, that require uh, further engagement, further refinement uh, in terms of the instruments uh, that underlie the AFCFTA. And so there have been some delays, unfortunately. Uh, and then, of course, generally borders have uh, have uh, closed down in many cases, um, and and the path uh, for moving goods has also narrowed. It's become, uh, of course, a lot more uh, sticky, uh, where there has been continued openness. So it's it's been a very difficult year in terms of cross-border movement, uh, clearly people, but but also goods as well. And so it's, it's been a little bit of a, uh, of a setback for sure, but it's a temporary setback in the same way uh, the other uh, effects are by and large temporary. Of course, that is everybody's hope is that we'll see the bounce come back and that these are, there's no permanent damage being, being affected to the structure of trade and the, the underlying economies and the companies uh, that have been affected. All right, temporary setback, you say, but let's look at some of the moves you've been making. I see that you guys have been quite busy talking about the moves you're making with the World Bank and uh, MEGA as well. Let's get into that and give us details of that regional infrastructure project uh, and the reasons for the inception of it. Well, you know, uh, Kenneth, we've uh, come up with a little bit of a motto here at TDB, uh, which is something that many other public uh, or PPP type DFIs would also say we we've gone into overdrive uh, when the lockdown basically came in and the reason being is because of course uh, we are uh, special financial institutions we're expected to step in and uh, and sometimes do a little bit more during difficult times uh, when the, the the conventional commercial and capital markets uh, sort of um, go into into severe volatility or pullbacks and risk appetite. So 
we've been extremely busy in, in, in building new partnerships and expanding existing partnerships. So the World Bank, of course, has been a, a global leader in our industry in many ways. Uh, and of course, they have a very significant balance sheet and they've been stepping up their, their financial allocations to, to the African continent, uh, both through the national or the domestic channels that they conventionally have, but also scaling up their regional uh, window and their regional uh, facilities. And so we identified the World Bank as, as, a, as a new partner we could uh, do some innovation with to, to unlock uh, regionally orientated funds that the World Bank has in place and that's been increasing over time. Uh, so typically uh, what we've managed to do is, is establish a, a funding partnership with the World Bank Group. Uh, and uh, this is of course not something that has been common in our industry. So we're essentially one of the very first who've, um, who've managed to form such a partnership with the World Bank. And it's, as you mentioned, it's uh, just over $400 million. It's long-term funding. It's intended for regional infrastructure broadly defined and it's been it's been quite an innovation actually and uh, we're very pleased that the World Bank has also uh, looked at the landscape of uh, financial institutions a little bit more differently they've opened up and uh, and, and and you know accepted uh, regional banks like ours to to become uh, strong partners of theirs and so we're looking forward to executing on this uh, facility and, uh, and to sort of also uh, proving the concept because there's many other regional banks we believe uh, will also want to follow suit in what we've managed to, to establish. Uh, and I should just mention that um, oh, the, the World Bank uh, partnership is, is, is too in form. You've made reference to the World Bank uh, proper as it were, but there's also the partnership that we formed with MIGA which is of course uh, a one of the one of the institutions in the World Bank group and then there's also been some some fascinating uh, trailblazing we've done with 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 MIGA as well separate from the 400 million that's another all right, then we'll, 350 million yeah all right then we'll get into that MIGA guarantee in a bit because I'm looking at that many first when you talk about these projects that you're talking about talking about the IFF that's the regional infrastructure uh, uh, financing facility and um, but definitely but I would like to know first how the TDB plans to utilize these funds and uh, where, are the, where are you setting your sights on well you know we we, we cover uh, just over 20 economies uh, in the African continent so we uh, have a fairly broad geographic scope and we're looking at uh, prospective beneficiaries of this funding and these beneficiaries are intended to be either PPPs or, or private sector directly uh, and the idea is of course to, to find sustainable projects that expand energy uh, or also promote connectivity in terms of ICT or transport uh, and we're trying to do it in a smart way. We're trying to do it in a 21st century manner that tries to, to advance uh, other agenda items like the sustainable development goals or the climate finance uh, objectives that uh, we have signed up to as TDB alongside others. So we're trying to do a um, combination of, um, of things with this facility. One is of course to boost uh, infrastructure on a regional basis, but also to promote it uh, in a manner that doesn't exacerbate uh, debt sustainability considerations or also uh, cause uh, additional carbon footprints by, by doing uh, unclean energy, so to speak. So, so this, these are some of the key aspects, but it's broad because it's not just energy. It's, 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 it's as I said, uh, it could be fiber optic cables. Uh, it could be uh, other kinds of ICT projects. Of course, transport uh, infrastructure is very important in the region and uh, the, the, the regional agenda of integration, a huge part of it, of course, is transport. The inefficiencies that the African economies have and the companies they're in has a lot to do with uh, inefficiency in, in movement of goods and, and, and people as well. So we're looking forward to seeing, uh, uh, you know, uh, strong uh, contenders. Uh, looking to take advantage of this facility. We, of course, have a strong portfolio already as it exists uh, that deals with uh, various types of infrastructure, uh, you know, 
uh, partners, clients, um, and, and we, we do it across multiple sectors. And, and several of them, of course, are already private. So we have a very good understanding of how to work with private companies or PPPs. And uh, we, we, we look uh, to scale up in that regard, uh, working on the experience we've had, the success factors that we've come to understand in terms of how to do this kind of on lending. All right, definitely quite a lot there, but I'm trying to understand the impact that you're trying to achieve with these initiatives. Well, you know, uh, impact is, is, is why we exist. We're very, uh, of course, uh, centered on ensuring that we, we deliver impact. Uh, one of the substantive areas, of course, is ensuring that there's just more connectivity, more bandwidth, uh, and that connectivity could be households, and it could be done through partnerships with industrial energy providers, it could be IPPs, but it could also be other corporates who do co-generation projects and feed uh, various types of uh, you know, users with that kind of power. And, and, and so that would be one kind of impact, would be more households being connected to affordable energy, reasonable energy, uh, clean energy as much as possible. But then it would, of course, be more efficiency in transport uh, and, and, of course, better connectivity in terms of access to, to bandwidth so that, uh, you know, individuals, um, whether it's people in schools or just ordinary citizens wanting to have better access to information and to be able to take advantage of um, this revolution we've all been so excited about with ICT enabled uh, business, whether it's finance, banking, but also other areas like e-government. And so connectivity is, is the critical uh, impact area that we're looking at across various infrastructure sectors. Definitely quite a lot to unpack there as you go on, and I wish you all the best. But I'm also trying to get from your view, because you mentioned earlier uh, financing models, and I'd like to you know, get your, pick your brain a little to find out what which you think is the best fit, especially when it comes to financing long-term infrastructure projects in Africa. Yeah, you know, it's it's a good question because there's been different phases we've gone through. Uh, we've just come out of a 10 to 15 year era of uh, public sector driven infrastructure development, which has generated a lot of new assets. Uh, it has uh, really helped close some of the gap. Of course, the gaps remain big in some countries, very big, uh, but there has been good good progress. But I think what's become very clear now is uh, we need to shift gears because we don't want to exacerbate uh, the the debt sustainability concerns that are already uh, in, 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 in existence. Uh, I think debt sustainability is not, uh, it's not at a crisis level yet in most countries, but I think, uh, you know, it is, it is uh, heightened. It's increased quite a bit. And so there is need to, to look at other ways of delivering infrastructure through uh, private participation, whether it's PPPs or purely uh, privately owned infrastructure service providers. We've seen, of, we've seen the power of that in the case of telecoms, right? We've seen the revolution in telecommunications over the past 20 years. And these were all vendors, private sector, telephone operators who managed to, 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 to introduce that quantum leap, that huge leapfrogging we saw in Africa. And now we would like to see some of that happen in the area of generation of power uh, that, of course, now is embracing new technology in ways we hadn't seen before, thanks to the advances in technology and the reduction in costs of certain technology. But we've also seen the, 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 the rise of mini grids and, and alternative solutions to, 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 to sort of massive national grids. And so that, that creates even more room for private participation, and we think that that can be uh, another, um, you know, innovative way of, of, of beginning to, to, to press uh, more strongly on closing the gaps without causing public sector sustainability problems on the financial side. All right, definitely a lot, definitely a lot to unpack. Uh, I needed to hold that thought for a second. We'll take a quick break. I've been speaking to Admasu Tades, he's the president and chief executive of the Trade and Development Bank. We'll continue beyond markets after the break.
Welcome back to Beyond Market. If you're just joining us, now my guest today is the President and Chief Executive of the Trade and Development Bank in Kenya, Matsu Tades. And he's been breaking down quite a lot recently, uh, talking about building resilience for trade finance on the continent, talk about some new deals that his organization has been into, and we're going to explore a little more on that. Just before we left off on the break, he was just talking about, you know, the importance of, uh, you know, you find getting that right financing model, you know, and the one that is a best fit for long-term financing, uh, long-term infrastructure projects in Africa. But at Masu, I would like you to take it a first step further and find out, you know, in looking at these financing models, and I'd like to get your thoughts on the challenges we're seeing, you know, financing infrastructure in the middle of a pandemic. Well, um, it's, uh, it's of course been quite challenging to, to, to conduct business uh, in the way that we, we historically have, and I think most financial institutions are the same. What we typically do is we, we do due diligence as we consider uh, opportunities to deploy our, our capital, our funding. And uh, it's of course uh, not very easy to, to do this kind of um, uh, base work, uh, pre-work to disbursements by, uh, you know, uh, getting to know your client and doing the, the various appraisals that are typically done when we do these kinds of uh, uh, of, uh, of, of deal uh, prospecting. So, you know, when you can't meet with clients directly, when you can't go and visit the areas that are being considered for investment, when you can't do the social appraisals to ensure that there's not going to be any adverse impacts on the communities around the area, you need to look at a number of issues uh, before, you, of course, you can, you can sign off on these transactions. And so we have found ways around it. Uh, we've relied more on local partners in the countries where we don't have presence. We do have presence in several countries, but there's, of course, a good number where we don't have presence. And so we've uh, resorted to, uh, you know, relying on local partners in a way that we haven't always. And so we ask others to, to, to do some of the work on our behalf and we try to confirm it and validate and do the quality assurance uh, on our end as well. And so there's been, um, of course, a disruption in, in movement and, and therefore there has been a requirement to, to find innovative, technologically enabled ways of, of, doing, of doing business, not, not so different from what we're doing on this interview as well. And so it's not been uh, easy, mm -hmm. but we have mm -hmm. found ways of, of bucking the trend. Uh, this adverse trend. I mean, just to give you an example, as a trade finance bank, we have um, uh, embraced uh, what is called, you know, uh, distributed ledger technology, what is called blockchain. And we've used that to, to, to accelerate trade finance transactions that require a lot of exchange of information through classical, conventional documentary forms that would typically be the way of, of doing business. But we've we've introduced innovations that had not really been uh, introduced yet into this particular practice of banking, trade finance banking, as it were. So, you know, th there has been an unexpected benefit of COVID-19 in that it has forced us to to actually embrace technologies that have been in place but had not really uh, been uh, fully embraced, so to speak. And and so that's been one way in which we've managed to. Uh, curtail the the long time frames that are involved in moving documents from from capital to capital, getting original sign offs and all of that. So now we're moving to digital technology. We're doing digital sign offs, and uh, and the world has moved very quickly to accept that. In fact, I, I should even say that the this novel World Bank uh, regional facility that we've signed, we signed it uh, digitally which was also quite uh, interesting because it's not uh, the conventional way in which one would normally sign big, big uh, loan facilities like this. All right, yeah, but quite a lot definitely when you talk about keeping up with due diligence and in, in the line of work that you do. But I'd like to speak to liquidity and the financing challenges that are, that are in there as well, because definitely the whole world is trying to deal with this maybe short to medium term shock. We don't know how long it's going to last. But I'd, I'd like to know how much finance is available for long term projects at a time like this when the whole world, like I rightly said, is uh, dealing with a short term shock like COVID. Yeah, you know, this has been a very difficult period in the sense that even short-term funding, liquidity, has been under serious pressure. 
uh, especially in the beginning part of the pandemic where there was so much uncertainty and so much pulling back by uh, capital markets, by banks, uh, by investors across the board. And so, of course, there was, uh, there was a flight to safety, as we often refer to in the industry. And, and so emerging markets and frontier markets were no longer considered to be uh, acceptable by way of risk. So there was a lot of uh, that kind of uh, pullback going on. Uh, so that has uh, been quite systemic. And, 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 and of course, it did have an effect of choking uh, liquidity, both uh, for short-term trade deals, but but also uh, for those that had found success in issuing longer-term bonds, 10-year bonds. In some cases, you had countries that were issuing 20-year issuing bonds, 30-year bonds. Countries like Kenya and Egypt and a few others have uh, managed to, to issue long-term bonds, Ghana as well. Uh, and, and so, that that requires uh, you know risk appetite to be to be solidly on, and and so in the in the early months of the pandemic uh, there was a pullback, and so both long term funding and short term funding got 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 affected, uh, but this is again where the institutions like uh, the World Bank Group, but also other development finance institutions such as KFW of Germany, China Development Bank, AFD of France. These are several strategic funding partners of TDB. Uh, we're very happy to see that they, uh, you know, bucked the trend and, and, and really proved their character by stepping up in this time of, uh, of difficulty and providing some counter cyclical, uh, you know, effect in the way in which they were looking at uh, our part of the world. So we've been able to raise uh, record levels of funding actually over the past six months. We've talked uh, at length uh, of what we've just signed off with the World Bank Group together with MIGA and IDA, about 800 million. But uh, I haven't mentioned what we've managed to do with several other partners, including the African Development Bank Group, uh, the, the French uh, Agency uh, for Development, AFD, KFW, uh, Badia, which is the Arab Bank for Economic Development in Africa, and and even the Koreans have come to the party, and we signed a hundred million dollar facility with with a Korean bank just uh, a month ago. So uh, all in all, we've we've signed uh, new commitments of funding uh, of not far off from two billion U.S. dollars just in the past six months. But these are all what we would call all right, you know, the finances either that I see agencies. Very busy. Oh, yes, definitely. Uh, very busy indeed. And um, this is why our motto has been go into overdrive when the world locks down, because the world expects you to to step up and do a little bit more in this kind of difficult environment. Definitely a lot, uh, doing a little bit more is quite important at this time. And I'd like you to speak to the importance of getting that technical assistance credit along with, the, with that World Bank uh, and, and the deal as well, and how this will bolster uh, the TDB's uh, capacity going forward, and also the importance of getting that mega guarantee at, also at this time. Well, you know, when you spoke about liquidity and funding gaps in this time, uh, this, uh, this technical assistance facility also speaks to those constraints and those funding gaps, but it looks uh, to other specific types of gaps related to, for instance, feasibility studies or pre-feasibility studies, diagnostics, the kinds of, uh, of, of interventions that need to precede a, 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 real, a real facility that would actually deliver implementation funds, right? So in our industry, there's always been this challenge of, of, of getting what we call, you know, project preparation funding uh, in place so that you can actually help prepare uh, the ground, the transaction for bankability or for funding. And of course, uh, it's, it's a necessary step in financing any significant project to do, of course, the early work that actually gives you the confidence to proceed with the much bigger sums. And so there's typically a, a, a very significant amount of funding that you need to put into place. The rule of thumb is roughly 5% of the capex that would uh, go into a project would be needed uh, in terms of pre-work, pre-financing work. So if it's a $100 million project, generally you need 5 million from inception to go through all the different stages of proving that this project is sustainable and feasible. 
And that requires special purpose funding. And this is what we were fortunate to be, to be able to get from the World Bank Group. Uh, and it was very generous terms. It was 38 year money that would allow us to to draw down on this type of uh, funding, special purpose funding, to, to help unlock uh, deals that we think uh, have a very good prospect of, of getting off the ground. And so that's what the technical assistance facility was. Uh, but there was also another piece that went to uh, our uh, strategic um, partner, which is COMESA, uh, which is the, the regional economic community from which we, we were uh, originated. And they, of course, uh, got a nice uh, chunk of this kind of TA funding. And for them, it was actually grant funding that allows them to, to work with SMEs and also uh, regional, regional uh, infrastructure projects in terms of the, the preparation and the advanced work. So it's been a very useful type of funding that uh, oh, has know. been made available. Definitely, definitely quite useful for you, definitely. But I'd like to know how much this uh, guarantee from MEGA will impact your ability to, you know, provide finance to the low-income countries as well. And also the importance of linking that regional development banks to commercial banks at a time like this and the opportunity this uh, linkage unlocks for, 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 for trade finance. Well, you know, this, this, MEGA, this MEGA facility uh, came in at, 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 the, at a perfect time, in a sense, because... It had the effect of just shoring up confidence by the market and the funding counterparts we would normally work with. It just gave them that additional uh, comfort to continue doing business, to continue participating in, in funding uh, proposals that we had sent out. And, and what it did is that it actually did two very specific things. It extended the tenor of our trade finance funding. Normally we would raise three year money or five year money, as we say, this was door to door 10 year funding. Even though it is for trade finance, it comes with a lot of breathing room and it allows us to, to also um, be benefit from what we call as a grace period, which means you only start repaying the, the loan in year five. So it's very attractive in terms of of tenor in terms of the grace period and in terms of also the the cost of the the, the final cost of the financing, and and of course uh, a bank like ours is is at the forefront of what is referred to as being a region that has a lot of opportunity but a lot of fragile economies and a lot of low income countries or LDCs, as as is referred to in the industry and these are really very frontier type economies where global markets normally don't tread easily. These are not uh, economies or countries that are rated in any particular way to enable private financing to flow. So what the MIGA facility effect in effect did was it enabled a bank like ours that actually steps into this kind of very tough neighborhood to, to actually provide firepower, financial firepower to, to reach the, these last mile type economies, if you can refer to it that way. And it's been very developmental in that regard. And so it had an unlocking uh, effect, but it also had uh, an enhancement effect, both on the cost side, the tenor side, and the grace period uh, aspect as well. All right, then. definitely quite a lot. And I wish you all the best in the work that you're doing, you know, to raise that capital for these kind of economies that need it at a time like this, where the world is dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. I've been speaking to Admasu Tades, he's the president and chief executive of the Trade and Development Bank. And that's it on Beyond Markets for today. And thank you so much for being a part of the show. Remember, you can catch the show at 5 p.m. West Africa time and have access to all episodes of Beyond Markets on our website. That's at cnbcafrica.com. For me and the team, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.